could say that it has been 25 years since uh, NAND flash memory has been around. So what I wanted to do was give you a five minute you know, plug-in of what has happened in this 25-year uh, period. So these memory cells were available before 1984 as well. You, you can uh, program uh, a non-volatile memory, but to erase them, you had to place them under a UV light. So these were, uh, you had to essentially, I don't know if any of you had used these chips, but you had to take them under a UV light if you wanted to erase them. Then in 1984, uh, this uh, gentleman, uh, uh, Masuoka San from Toshiba, he invented this uh, flash memory cell and it was uh, of the NAR architecture. He presented in the IDM conference that year. Earlier that year, he applied for a patent for the same. And uh, this was you know, the first uh, cell which you could uh, program using an electrical signal and also erase using an electrical signal. But this was NAR kind of memory. Uh, same set, same bunch of characters. They uh, again thought that you know this uh, we can uh, increase the density, and they uh, they came up uh, with using this uh, cell in a NAND fashion. And this was presented in uh, 1988. Patents in the same year, and you can see that NAND uh, array, and it looks pretty much the same. It was it just the number, the size of it has gone up, but uh, it's essentially uh, that same. Uh, architecture and Mr. Masuoka san was actually instead of being rewarded for his uh, invention he was uh, he was demoted uh, from his position and that you know so this is something very quaint related to Japanese uh, culture I, I showed you in the pre lecture on finfit that was also invented by uh, hisamoto san from Hitachi and he too you know didn't get any uh, benefit uh, for uh, his uh, invention. And uh, so there was IEEE awarded him a very big award in uh, 2002. But in spite of inventing this multi-billion dollar uh, market, his uh, parent company did not give him any uh, reward. There's a nice, a nice article about him over here. He's now a professor uh, at uh, Tohoku. So I find this you know, very uh, I, I'll tell you another story when we get to LED that was also invented by uh, a Japanese inventor, uh, Nakamura-san. And uh, he, too, was actually demoted because of his invention. And he's, well, he left that company and sued them later. But So this is, uh, <clears throat> this is something you, know, you find uh, very contradictory to the culture in the valley where you are, if you are a nail sticking out, you get hammered in if you are uh, in that culture as compared to here where you you get rewarded and you can raise money to pursue your idea. But anyway, the, the next thing which happened was uh, in 1997, people realized that you know we have the cell. Why not start storing more bits into it? So multi-level cell was really invented, not really invented, but came into production in 1997. And most of these cells, uh, that you see in your iPads and your iPhones are multi-level set. <clears throat> and then from 2002 to 2010, which is really the post-PC era, 2002 it started to uh, just the beginning of it. And since then, the flash memory capacity has doubled every year. So it's also known as Huang's law, and it's a more aggressive law than Moore's law. Mulla said that your capacity should double every 18 months. This law is that your total capacity that you can buy in one chip, not one die, in one chip, should double every year. And in fact, it has been uh, uh, progressing, uh, or at, at least progressed at that rate from 2002 to 2010. It was named after this guy, Huang Cheng Yu. He was the uh, president of. Uh, uh, Samsung Electronics, and Samsung is one of the dominant players in flash memory, both flash and DRAM memory. Back in 2003, it also became cheaper than DRAM, and it, nowadays, in most of the memory system, you have very limited amount of DRAM, but most of your storage happens uh, in your NAND, and that's because it's, it's an order of magnitude cheaper than DRAM. And to th in this year, you can buy one single die which has 128 gigabit or uh, 
16 gigabyte of storage in one single die. You can also buy this tiny chip which stores 120 giga, gigabytes. So most people, you know, their hard disk, most of their storage requirements can be met by this one single chip which has almost the capacity of your uh, hard drive. But it still remains much more expensive than hard drive. That's why hard drives have been so hard to displace. And it's still an order of magnitude uh, expensive than hard drive. And that's because hard drive prices also keep on uh, falling. So I described these numbers, right? That NAND flash cost a uh, dollar a giga, uh, gigabyte or 70 cents a gigabyte. So. But I was not describing those numbers for uh, a single level cell, but those were for a two-bit uh, two MNC that's most commonly used in uh, most of your uh, uh, iPhones and iPads. All right, so any, any questions on history? <coughs> All right, so let's look at how do we make these uh, make these chips, right? So let's look at the process technology. It's a course about manufacturing. So, so this is how if you open one of these uh, chips up, it would uh, look like you see these, uh, these bit lines, and they'll be separated by these very high aspect ratio uh, trenches. So a quick question to answer is that you know, we have learned about lithography. So looking at this picture, uh, what do you think which lithography was used? So if you look a li little deeper and you think about it, you see these two different trench depths. So clearly, you know, it looks like they used a double patterning technique. And this was not a chip from 2012. It's actually a chip from uh, 2007. And so flash memory has been using double patterning for a while before even Logic started using it. So if you uh, open up your uh, iPhone, as we did uh, in our uh, first class, you see that uh, this big chip, that is your uh, NAND memory chip. And whether you buy a 16 gig phone or you buy a 32 or a 64 gig phone, you always get that one single chip. So why, how is that possible, right? So the reason why it's possible is that if you open up that chip, it's not uh, just one die, but it's multiple of these dies stacked on top of each other. So you can have up to 32 of these dies uh, stacked on top of each other. Each of these would be 8 gigabyte or somewhere in that order. And they are, you know, they are still connected using these wire bonds. And we'll talk about, when we talk about, uh, uh, when we discuss packaging in, uh, in lecture number six, that how are these connected together. And it's quite amazing that, you know, there's 32 of these chips and you have these wire bonds and none of them shard to each other. And if you look at each one of this die, it's essentially nothing but a large array of memory. And often memory are defined by this term, which is called array efficiency. That is, how much die area is covered with the actual memory cell. So a DRAM, for example, has an array efficiency of 60%. Uh, NAND flash has an area efficiency of 90 to 80%. That is, more than 80% of this die is just these NAND memory cells. The rest, that is the 20% is this peripheral circuitry, your uh, charge pumps that would be required to generate that high voltage, and your row and uh, page decoders. But still, 80% of the area is all, it's nothing but these banks of uh, memory. Right. right, so <clears throat> how do we make these things? So I guess it's, it's for that, it, uh, for making this a pretty simple device, all you need to do is pattern bit lines and then pattern word lines. And for each of these intersection, you get a cell below them. Right, so let's look at some of these uh, intersections. So when you pattern these bit lines, you essentially separate them with a shallow trench isolation. Since each of them is carrying such a high voltage, you want to isolate them. So there's a very deep uh, uh, STI edge to separate them. And when you draw these word lines, these word lines, as we we'll see, these they tend to overlap and flow around these uh, bit lines. And I'll show you why that is the case. 
So let's look at few of these uh, cross sections. This cross section I already showed you. This is a cross section taken along this direction. So if you have these multiple bit lines, and if you take a cross section like this, what you see is these bit lines, and they are separated by uh, this very high aspect ratio STIH. So this is a very sophisticated, not sophisticated, but a very high aspect ratio structure that you need to etch. Then you also need to fill it. And uh, that's what separates these uh, different uh, bit lines. And uh, on top of each bit line, you can see a cell over here. That is, uh, this is your, where your cell is located. Right now, what if we look a cross section along this side? So, if you take a cross section along your, along one of your uh, bit line that is intersecting multiple of these word lines, what you'll see in this cartoon is essentially these multiple of these uh, transistors, right, or multiple of these apartments which are uh, connected in series to each other, right? Or if you draw, uh, uh, if you draw. Uh, uh, a more device-friendly kind of picture, you'll see these multiple of these uh, uh, gate stacks and these transistors connected in series to each other. Right, so this is an actual picture which I showed you uh, earlier also. So it shows this is a picture taken along one of these word lines. So you see multiple of these transistors, and at the end you have something connecting, but in between them essentially it's just a string of transistors and they are just connected in series to each other. And to read any or one of them, I need to turn on all these others so I can read what's in here, right? So let's look at a closer look at how it looks like when I look along a particular word line. So when I look along a particular word line, this word line is wrapping around my different uh, bit lines. And you can clearly see over here, so this is the vestige of one of the STI etches. And I have my tunnel uh, oxide over here. And this tall thing is my floating gate. But what I see is my word line or my control gate is wrapping around it. So I see this uh, ONO, so this is my interpoly dielectric. And this other whole thing on the top, which is wrapping around, is my uh, control gate. So. The reason why it's uh, wrapped around is because you want to remember our GCR, which I said we want to keep it as high as possible. So we want to keep this word line capacitance with my cell as high as possible. And one way to increase that capacitance is just wrap around that contact around my gate, right? So I get more area and hence I get more capacitance. And that's how uh, people have been doing it. So this. Uh, word line wrapping around your cell is to essentially achieve a high gate coupling ratio. So now you can see one, two, three, four of these STIs standing out. And then you have your tunnel oxide over here. This is your floating gate. And then you can see this ONO dielectric uh, or your uh, control gate on top of that dielectric wrapping on your on top of uh, these cells. Any questions on this part? So actually, this, this post-PC era has accelerated this uh, flash memory so much that it, you know, it has developed far beyond uh, what people predicted it to. It has scaled far beyond uh, what people expected uh, to happen. So this is uh, a picture from the ITRS roadmap of uh, 2006. And it says that you know in 2012, you'll have a memory available uh, with 32 nanometer feature size. And that also, it was in red. So people didn't know how it will happen. Right? It was so uncertain back in uh, 2006. But since economy drove it, since these iPhone, iPads drove it so much, Actually, this happened much before. In 2012, you can buy a chip which is uh, 20 nanometer in feature size and 64 uh, gigabit in one single die. So it's you know it's hard to predict the future, and uh, so it's all driven by. Uh, so this is how aggressive uh, your post PC devices have driven the flash memory. 
right? And since it's a very simple layout, I showed you the layout, it's essentially nothing but these very periodic bit lines and uh, word lines. So it's a very simple structure to do lithography on. There's no grating. I mean, no, there's no grating. There's no cut required. All is required is these gratings. So uh, this, in fact, has uh, uh, become the driver for lithography as well. So Nand Flash was the first to use uh, double patterning. It has been using it for you know, quite a few generations now. And it's right now they are the first to use quadruple patterning as well. And they can do that because they have these very regular lines. And you can uh, print these gratings very easily using these uh, double patterning or uh, quadruple patterning techniques. So it has become a driver of lithography. As I showed you, the minimum feature size. Oh, I missed actually a point. So remember, I showed you that earlier SanDisk announcement had a statement that the minimum feature size is uh, 19 nanometer. So that's actually a very uh, misinforming uh, uh, piece of information because the spacing is not the same between your bit line and my word line. Since my uh, this line has to wrap around, so since it has to wrap around, there's no way I can bring it very close without losing this wrap around. So what I see is that these lines are actually are separated more, and these lines are more closer. So this 90 nanometer is the separation between two word lines, but the bit line separation is actually longer. And people report, when they report that the, my feature size is 90 nanometer, typically they are reporting this separation. This separation actually, as you can read from this picture, is, is more than 90 nanometer. <coughs> 